Okay, Dietrich, thank you very much and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Miller and I'm the Executive Director of the Rochester Regional Library Council, one of the nine councils that comprise the NY3Rs Association, the sponsor of today's program. I'm also the facilitator of the statewide NY3Rs work group on libraries as publishers. Libraries as publishers is one of the six statewide priorities that are part of a plan called an Information Infrastructure for New York, or I to New York. And you see on your screen now the uh, copy of the final report. This plan was created through a series of meetings and surveys of all New York libraries uh, in 2012 and 2013. There are six work groups being facilitated by the NY3Rs. The five other groups are enhancing access to research databases, participation in the Digital Public Library of America, clearinghouse and communications, outcomes and assessment, and staff training, retraining, and exchanges. And there's more about all of these on the NY3Rs website, which is www.ny3rs.org. Now a little bit more about our priority today, libraries as publishers. Uh, this is a new role for libraries, but what's it all about? Libraries as publisher encompasses many different activities. So far in this brown bag series, we've heard about the SUNY Open Textbook Project, in which librarians were working with faculty to produce e-textbooks to use across SUNY. We also heard from the folks at the Rochester Public Library who turned vanity publishing into community engagement through production of a highly successful self-published author's fair. Today's program, Selling Stuff, LibraryCommerce.com, takes a completely different approach from our prior two presentations. We will learn about selling publications over the internet. We hope that all five of the online discussions, which as Deidre says are being recorded and available on the NY3R's website, will inspire your library to become a publisher for your community, whatever that community is. At the end of the series, in the summer, the NY3Rs Association will be offering uh, seed money through a grant, $10,000, to a library or libraries in New York to undertake an innovative library publishing project. And there'll be more about that uh, on our web website um, in June or July. Now to today's presentation, Selling Stuff, LibraryCommerce.com. The Sibley Music Library at the Eastman School of Music, University of Rochester, has some of the most important research and performance collections of scores in the world. Our guests, Alice Carley and Dan Lopetta, will tell us about selling stuff. Alice came to Rochester to study musicology at the Eastman School in 1988. A fascination with both systems management and hand-on bookbinding and paper repair led her to work in the Sibley Music Library. And there she took on the position of conservator in 1995. Her professional activity since has been related to the preservation of music materials, and she recently helped to coordinate two major grant projects to digitize public domain scores from the Sibley circulating collections. Dan spent 20 years working in fulfillment, warehouse marketing, and catalog operations management. He then returned to school to pursue his passions receiving degrees in music and library science. He is the digitization project assistant at Sibley Music Library, where he combines his previous operations skills with his music and library knowledge to accomplish the project we're going to hear about today. By the way, Dan also is a local musician who plays electric and string bass with a variety of groups from jazz to blues to rock. And if you're interested, you can hear him perform regularly at the Putneyville group Grill, sorry, uh, with this group, Jenna and the Hops. So welcome, Alice and Dan. We want to hear more about this unique and interesting event. And listeners, reminder, during the presentation, you can uh, chat your questions in the chat window, and we'll be answering them at the end of our presentation. So on to you, Dan and Alice. Hi, I'm Alice Carley, and Dan Lapata and I will be talking about our experience so far with setting up production and sale of library-related stuff. In my library's case, music scores printed out from library-produced digital scans. We've learned a lot from our project, and we want to share the opportunities we see as well as the barriers we've found. 
We will also be asking questions to help us see whether our project may be directly useful to other libraries. I've had a year to get used to the phrase library commerce, and I no longer find it disturbing much. But it certainly does raise questions. The first question is also the first and foremost barrier. Libraries are built to give free access to information. We lend out books. We give patrons access to reference materials. We train people to use information sources, all without charge because of the importance of these services to a democratic society. As our culture becomes ever more monetized, should we libraries remain as a last bastion of the ethic of offering good things freely because they are good? The problem is that libraries, chronically underfunded, are being asked to do more and more with less and less. At the point of diminishing returns, perhaps alternate revenue streams need to be considered as part of a solution. Between 2007 and 2013, Sibley Music Library used National Endowment for the Humanities grant funding to digitize some 20,000 volumes, mostly public domain scores from its circulating collections. As early as spring 2009, a school administrator asked if there were any way we could create revenue from these. Could we sell access? Libraries. Sell stuff. We said no. The grant itself stipulated free access. We wrote it that way. But it did occur to me that it's hard to read music from a computer screen and often frustrating to do so from home printouts. My department is expert at making nice preservation copies of library scores. Maybe we could sell these. In that light, my next question. How many he people here today would, in fact, be interested in selling something as an additional revenue stream? Let's try this as a yes-no poll. And Deidre, I think you can pull that poll over. Everybody who would like to sell something, uh, click yes. Uh, those who don't think that this would be appropriate for them, click no. Wow, OK. So far, that's about how why we're here today. A lot of people, it looks like 12 people, have said, yes, they're interested in selling something. So let's uh, go back and go on to the next questions. Forward. Uh, yeah, there we go. How many of you are already selling something? Used books in the foyer. Use the chat box to type in comments you have as we go, and keep an eye on it. I'm hoping it will be interesting to follow, and we'll be coming back to people's comments and questions later in the presentation. What things might be appropriate for your library to sell rather than lend or give for free? Library branded mugs, mouse pads, bookmarks? Are there services your library would like to provide on site or online, but cannot offer because you cannot afford to do so? Do you own high resolution facsimiles or interesting historical collections to which you can only provide limited access due to financial constraints or insufficient staff or equipment? Would you make editorial or research or author education services available on a paid basis at the library or its website if there were a way to do so that did not overwhelm library staff or facilities. Are these questions disturbing, given that the services might be available only to those who could afford them? Are there ways to ameliorate that problem? We'll see what comments people may have in the chat box now. And if there is interest, we can continue this conversation online. You can contact me using the email address that will show at the end of this presentation if you'd like to join an email thread. For now, let's go to the next barrier. How many libraries can now accept credit card payments? Use that emoticon drop down Deirdre showed you, the one with the guy with the hand raised up. With a green check mark if you can, red if you cannot. Let's see. Yep, lots of green check marks, but some red. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there is a, there is a barrier. Now how many libraries can do so online with one of those online shopping carts? Uh, again, green or red check for that, for online shopping carts. OK. A couple people can do it. All right. A fair number of people can't. And in fact, that's the barrier that is central to today's presentation. Finally, selling through Amazon requires allowing Amazon to make electronic payments directly into your institutional bank account.
How many people here are fairly certain that this would not be a problem for your library? Again, a green check if you think it would not be a problem so you could go forward. A red check if that elect direct electronic banking would stop you. Let's see how that is looking. We see some things changing to green. Let's see, we've got uh, three green checks and three red X's that I can see. So pretty evenly distributed there. OK. Uh, let me go through now. I want to describe my experience developing the project to sell printed scores for the Eastman School of Music. The library first started thinking about it in 2009, as I mentioned, and our first step was to visit Cornell, which has a large and successful department that sells on-demand reprints through Amazon and does digitization work in consultation. Here we discovered two major barriers, at least to online sales of printed scores from the Eastman School of Music. First, Amazon does not include black and white pamphlet on sturdy paper with heavy color cover among their print-on-demand formats. And the University of Rochester cannot accept payments through any of the electronic channels that Amazon offers. So far, our IT security has only approved a single electronic payment gateway, PayPal PayFlow, and that is not on Amazon's list. Cornell sells books, not scores, and their institutional IT department was willing and able to develop accounts receivable guidelines and processes that allow them to work with Amazon. But for our institution and product, this would not work. Regarding the pamphlet problem, I looked at several other third-party alternatives and discovered that they did not lend themselves to music pamphlets. Most offered either inexpensive black print on standard white paper or expensive color print on heavy paper throughout, but not in combination. When I did a time and material study for the particular situation of music pamphlets, producing them in-house using student labor was far more cost effective than any third party solution I found, since the, their economies of scale were offset by the fact that the third party needed to make a profit of its own. In-house production also gives us control over materials quality, which is an important factor in sheet music. 70 pound paper with the grain running short makes a difference for performing musicians, but it's not offered by any third party manufacturer. So I decided to assume in-house production for this particular product, at least for now. The distribution problem was more intractable and is the direct reason for the project we are presenting today. By 2011, I was meeting with other departments of the Eastman School of Music that had products to sell online, and our committee determined that even if Amazon were the most appropriate venue for selling the diverse group of products, including online lessons in theory and performance, the university could not, and still in 2014 cannot, work with Amazon. As of today, there are 21 potential products at Eastman, ranging from accepting credit card payments for admission, to the online lessons, to monograph and subscription to periodicals that departments would like to publish, either electronically or on paper. The school IT has been working since 2011 on a PayPal PayFlow gate, uh, payment gateway to handle these projects, and is, after a parade of missed deadlines, ready to do a trial of three of them, starting, they hope, in May. Security and liability remain a constant concern, since universities are major targets for hackers and cannot afford to be involved in credit card scandals. In the meantime, back in 2011, the committee decided that the cost of developing a site to sell scores on demand at the scale we were expecting was prohibitive, even if the technical problems could be solved, given the added costs of using IT staff to design the details of a site to handle a multitude of individually low-cost items. It occurred to me then that one possible solution would be to contract with an individual who could use a third-party sales site software, possible for an individual, though not for the university, to create a site, sell scores on their own behalf, as it were, and share the profit with Eastman by simply sending a paper check. So when I learned in 2012 that Dan Lapata, the project staff in charge of scan production for the big digitization project we were doing, had previous experience in warehouse management and online sales, 
I decided to look into the possibility of contracting with him after the end of the grant. He would build and manage a sales platform for our SCORES project, and in return would keep all profits earned during a trial period, after which he and Eastman would decide on next steps. As we were discussing the possibility, I saw a notification from RRLC of an annual grant offered by the Harold Hacker Fund for the Advancement of Libraries through the Friends and, Founda uh, Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library. We decided to use the grant opportunity as an occasion to get our ideas and thoughts organized into a viable project. Ah, uh, hmm, that's interesting. To our delight, not only did the application project process force us to develop a plan that could be made to work, we also were in fact chosen to receive the grant for that year. We used it to hire Dan part-time for five months while he did all the necessary research and work to choose the best sales platform and use it to develop a site for selling scores. And here it is. The funding from the Harold Hacker grant gave Dan the time he needed to create the site, while we concurrently worked on the contract with the Eastman School of Music. The site was finished in the five months, and I'll be turning the mic over to Dan shortly to describe it in more detail. But you could go right now to www.eastmanscorespublishing.com and buy a score. The contract took eight months, even though the school administration was excited about the idea. Dan first created a business called, let's get this arrow, Eastman Scores Publishing. We next determined that this business could not be owned by Dan because for trademark reasons, Eastman could not allow another party ownership of its name. That was OK, since we already knew we wanted a separate company that could be used for multi by multiple libraries, not just Eastman, even though Eastman branding would be used for the pilot project, which is this. So Dan also created a business called Library Commerce. Let me see if I can move that right down there to act as distributor. Finally, Dan and the University of Rochester contracted to allow Library Commerce to use Eastman School of Music branding and logo information on the Library Commerce site to sell music on behalf of Eastman's new entity, Eastman Scores Publishing. There we are, three, three things in uh, one little heading for a website. And now the final barrier, which we are working on here today. We finally brought Dan's site live in November and have since sold, as of today, 14 scores. If that low number is a surprise to you, as it was to us, that is because libraries normally give things away and librarians are only beginning to think about marketing. Dan spent the five months of the Harold Hacker grant building the site and the distributorship as planned. While the contract with Eastman permits the use of the name and logo, it did not offer such central marketing tools as networks, mailing lists, and known target audiences, or even a wide public announcement when the site went live. Indeed, as of yet, Eastman is not marketing the scores in any way and probably will not begin to do so until some of its other sales projects are further toward completion. Dan is still in the process of marketing projects for himself and can tell you that while the, uh, there we go, let's move this over, holiday music promotion was pretty much of a bust for this year as we went online a little too late, the NISMA, here it is, New York State School Music Association line has produced several sales already and will continue to build. He has also just contracted with the International Music Score Library Project, IMSLP for short, to have Eastman Scores Publishing appear on their list of publishers for people who want to purchase printed copies of Eastman Scores that they find on the IMSLP site, and there's a lot of them there. This is a huge deal since IMSLP is something like the Amazon of sheet music, only an Amazon where you can download whatever you want for free and only need to pay if you want it printed out. Let's see here. What we would like to do today with this brown bag lunch is to gauge the interest of other libraries in using this sales platform to sell items online as we first envisaged while putting our thoughts together for the Herald Hacker grant. Here is a mock-up of what the front page might look like if it were modeled rather quickly on the current site. 
Here, under the General Library Commerce banner, you can see clickable links. That's what uh, these would be, representing uh, libraries. Let's see. I have lost my place while I was looking at the clickable links. Um, representing individual library members, each of whom would have its page of product project hmm, products on the site, and they could have you know like library logos on their individual page if you were to click on any one of these links. Uh, and for this sample, I uh, made up some products. Uh, as if they were from libraries around the state uh, for these, uh, this is a sort of a sample front page that uh, is for everybody. And I will note that two of the products, the book uh, with courage and honor and the high res uh, images on CD are actually for sale online by the institutions mentioned. Though in both cases, the payment option at the institutional site is by check only, probably for reasons similar to those that I've already discussed. Meanwhile, here on the side is a list of, oh, let's see, I want to arrow back, is a list of uh, subcategories that people could use to see particular types of merchandise from multiple different libraries. Uh, I couldn't resist the action figures. I have the one of Nancy Pearl. Uh, she's a librarian from Seattle. I don't know if anybody's seen the librarian action figures. We think that if a group of libraries join together to actively promote their various products on the site, people will start to get used to the idea that if you want to buy something funky from a library, library commerce is the place to go online. And people who go there to buy something from one library will see samples on the front page of what they might find in others. The marketing term for that is synergy. And synergy is an important step toward overcoming the final barrier to library sales. Now that we've arrived at this point, how many people here today think their library might be interested in selling something on a library commerce site like this one? Use the green check if you think you might want to look further into the possibility. Couple green checks. More green checks. Great. Yes, we are would be interested in having company. I'm going to let Dan give a little further information about how the site works, and then we'll go on to answer questions that have come up on the chat board. Dan, over to you. Thank you, Alice. Um, I'd like to just start off with the, the most important thing after setting up the site with a product, and actually I'll go into a little bit about setting the site up with a product. Uh, I used MARC information, I used MARC records for the scores that I am currently selling on the website um, in order to populate an SEO, which is known as search engine optimization, and that is the function that allows people to go on Google and type in a search like Beethoven Sonata, and then you get a, uh, a list of sites that you can access a Beethoven Sonata, and then hopefully um, Library Commerce and Eastman Scores Publishing .com will be one of the first ones that pop up and people can find and buy exactly what they're looking for. And search engine optimization is a key point in marketing. And fortunately for librarians, uh, we do have these MARC records to work with, so it's been very, very helpful. But after setting that up, the most important thing was to figure out how we were going to accept payment. And so we, uh, library commerce is acceptable to, it is able to accept the four big credit cards as payment. As of now, checks by mail are not included at this time because Library Commerce needs to cover expenses and wants to deliver quickly. And snail mail is a three-step process. We place the order, send the check. When the check is received, ship the product. And that can take <laughs> weeks sometimes. Whereas with credit card processing, the payment is captured immediately. The order ships, and then the payment is processed. Capturing does not take the funds, but it holds that amount until the product is shipped because the regulations are you cannot process that money. You can't collect the money until the shipment occurs. E-checks were another layer of added expense as far as the merchant processing was concerned. 
and therefore is currently excluded and they're not really widely used as of now. I also have not included pay, the PayPal option at the moment um, as it incurs another expense and seems to be the biggest block to institutions processing transactions. If people were interested, I would add that to the list of things that um, uh, acceptable forms of payment. So the next thing is security. These certificates you're going to see in the lower left-hand corner of our website. What do these mean? Well, part of the service paid for using the Volusion service, Volusion is the third-party service that I'm using for this website, is an SSL certificate, which is a secured socket layer. When you see HTTPS colon backslash in your address window online, the S stands for secure, and all communication goes through layers of encryption. This protects the credit card holder, and protects library commerce. This is important to library commerce as we understand that institutions are looking to offset liability. Therefore, the liability is assumed by library commerce. I want to mention that Heartbleed, the virus, that attacked 66% of SSL sites. But these are only sites that use the software package called OpenSSL. Neither Volusion nor Authorize.net, which is the merchant provider that I use, use OpenSSL software. So they have not been affected. Volusion, Authorize.net, and therefore Library Commerce are safe from Heartbleed. Authorize.net has layers of security for credit card processing. There are address and card holder and other security in place. So if somebody tries to order something and their address is different than the cardholder address, I have options um, to accept or deny the order. Every order is presented to Library Commerce with a risk factor for that credit card. And it allows me to accept or decline an order if I see something is amiss. Finally, all credit card information is deleted upon capture, thus protecting Library Commerce, Volusion, and the purchaser from anybody stealing that information. Even with all of these protections, I want to be redundant here. Library Commerce assumes the liability for credit card transactions. That said, libraries utilizing Library Commerce for sales wouldn't assume that liability and they would be protected from the risk of having private financial information and or hackers coming across their servers because everything would be on the library commerce server. Library commerce then writes paper checks for profits incurred from sales to any participating library, thus negating any electronic threat to the library. And as far as I can tell, Harpley can still not corrupt a paper check. Beyond the, those two important points, collecting money and security, Library Commerce offers the following services. Some of these have limits. For example, on-demand printing. We are capable of doing this in some formats. I'm currently doing it with scores, but not all. We have the capabilities. Um, uh, we, we would, however, consult, research, and recommend solutions to any issues that we currently don't have the capabilities of doing in-house. Um, possibly help libraries in the New York 3Rs team up with printing and production resources. For example, an academic library may have poster reproduction capabilities, while another may have access to an espresso machine for self-published books. And then these libraries could work together in order to help each other do the production of certain things that they may not have the capabilities of selling themselves. These are the services on this slide that Library Commerce offers. But your library could build its own sales site using one of the many third-party solutions there are. There's 
things like big commerce, pollution. There's a number of solutions out there. That said, be prepared to be nickel and dimed by whichever service provider you use, including any merchant processing services that you're going to use. Also understand that all those third-party software providers, such as Volusion and Authorize.net, they're going to go to great length to offset any liability onto you and be prepared to spend significant time and resources learning the off-the-shelf products those providers have with little assistance from them. In my case, Volusion offered a three-month free trial. From the time of registering with Volusion to the time I went live, well more than five months had passed, and I had been paying out of pocket for services that there was no chance for a return on investment because I hadn't gone live. This was because it took this long just to develop the model, the branding, the product listings, the SEOs, the shipping methods, etc., etc., etc. To build it from scratch takes time. To use a hub allows you to sell now and take advantage of the synergy that happens when you're on a hub that has a number of libraries acting as a coalition. Here are some ideas that I have on how libraries might take advantage of creating a sales site or utilizing a site that already exists. And I think I've seen some of these uh, in the original uh, comments that came up when asked what you might be interested in selling. I would love to hear some of the ideas that you have. Thank you for taking the time to hear our experience. Um, I think we're going to address some questions. And if uh, you have more questions that we don't get a chance to answer in, during this session, you can always email us at, this, at, at these specific emails. Thanks. OK, Dan, thank you. And Alice, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, all this very interesting information. We do have some questions uh, already, and I encourage people to continue to send in their questions via the chat box. Uh, Cindy asks uh, about copyright issues, and uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I can talk about that. For the Sibley's scores, we actually had chosen two digitized scores that were in the public domain, so that question answered itself. However, um, Yes, you would have to make sure that you own whatever you're going to sell. Um, I've got some experience in that now myself, so that I can certainly uh, uh, help Dan with uh, um, any kind of consultation you have if there's questions that come up, because different formats and materials actually do have different copyright laws that apply. But yes, you would have to make sure that you have either have ownership of what you want to sell or have a, some kind of a contract with the copyright holder. That's also a possibility. And uh, we have a question from uh, Michelle who wants you to elaborate, if possible, on the distribution aspect of library commerce. I think that's probably a question for Dan. Yeah, there's there's a number of solutions with the distribution. Um, currently, uh, I'm I'm dealing with the production and distribution of online scores. And there are some in-house capabilities. So if um, production of reprints or coffee mugs or, or whatever were happening uh, were a capability that I could do, I could manage the distribution from that aspect. Or I could consult with um, a third-party solution for something like coffee mugs or whatnot and do a dropship type deal. As far as uh, distribution is concerned with anything that a library or organization that is doing the, their own production for something, um, that would act more as a dropship type situation where library commerce would process the transaction and then send the dropship information to whoever was doing the production and they would um, get the, the product out to the customer at that time. If I'm, under, if I'm understanding you correctly, Dan, then you really would handle the gathering in of the orders, and then but the actual production could be handled elsewhere 
and distribution could be could be handled elsewhere. It could be something that could be negotiated. Correct. I, it all Correct. depends on where the production is happening. Yes. Yes. I think that thing for everyone, all our listeners to uh, think about is that this is a pilot project. And we are open to trying different things uh, to see what might work. Uh, and in fact, some uh, Cindy and I think another uh, listener asked whether uh, you'd have to be a library to join this. So they're more of a museum, and I don't think that matters. Is that correct? No, uh, that would be. Uh, I think I was uh, any. Actually, it could be open to any member of New York Three R's, or it could be open to any New York State or beyond New York State cultural institution. That's, a, I think, a problem for there or a question for the, the people who want to become a part of it to answer. But I definitely, I think even on the sample slide that I did, I included a historical society. Because I we thought that did. that was yeah. very appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and Tom, Actually, uh, mind if, I'm sorry, go ahead, Alice. I want to go, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch back to that sample slide. Um, I went too far. Here we go. Because it might be useful to have it in front of us as we answer some of these other questions. And uh, Tom from Metro has asked, uh, he has mentioned that several um, libraries have done calendars as promotional items. Maybe this would be a good platform to sell this, those. Yes, definitely. Yeah. In terms uh, of, um, I'm sorry. Alice, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. Uh, Sherry Christ from Rochester Public Library says that they have a number of unpublished manuscripts of various aspects of Rochester's history. How could RPL get involved in library commerce? Talk to Dan. <laughs> I think we are now at the point, and Dan, I will let you continue with that, where we will be looking at making the transition from an Eastman Scores publishing site to a library commerce site. And that's Correct. What, one of the things that would be involved. Yes, and, and, and I, I want to repeat the, that this was a, a pilot program. And so I would really be interested in having a discussion with anybody that's interested so we could uh, determine what makes the most sense moving forward. Um, if you have. Um, unpublished manuscripts who would be producing the um, reprints of those manuscripts and then the distribution and then what type of revenue sharing would there be um, in order to keep the site running and, and so that you have your revenue stream and, and, and things like that. So those are all great discussions that I really welcome to have that I don't have a specific answer right now, but the best way to get involved with library commerce is to contact me. And you can contact me um, at dlapata at esm.rochester.edu. Or um, I will uh, provide a phone number. and uh, or, or you can contact me right through the library commerce website. Um, I will also mention that if you type in librarycommerce.com as well as eastmanscorespublishing.com, both domain names will take you to that website. And that's another advantage that we have as a hub that we could actually um, grab those domain names for your specific library. So if people are looking, they'll be directed to a central site. And uh, Sherry, I want you to know also that uh, Dan and Alice and I have talked about this, and we are likely to have a local meeting for interested parties who might want to participate in library commerce. So Dan, can, Dan and Alice can tell us a little bit more about what would be involved. Uh, we do have a question from Eleanor, who says she is a, a SUMLS distance student living in the North Country. And she'd like to see local libraries and historical societies be able to use this platform to sell reprints of historical records like newspapers, et cetera. Uh, I, uh, and Dietra adds uh, that she concurs. And we have New York Heritage, which is our digitization site, also going to be part of DPLA, Digital Public Library of America. And I think that might be a good format uh, for us to sell some of these things. Uh, Alice and Dan, you want to comment on that? I, I think that's a fantastic idea. It's one of the things that uh, uh, originally attracted me to 
um, it, it's one of the first thoughts that I had expanding beyond musical scores because we're talking about formats that are uh, a little bit different than your standard book binding um, things that you can do on a espresso machines or go through Amazon's third party uh, production sites. Uh, things that are a little bit unique that uh, that uh, a niche audience is actually looking for and wouldn't be able to find anywhere else. So I think those are that those are absolutely fantastic ideas. Um, another thing that had come up earlier um, in in the earlier chat boxes were somebody selling book bags and coffee mugs and things like that, and to be able to take headlines really popular headlines from a historical perspective and put those, brand those onto, um, uh, for lack of a better word, kitsch items that people would, you know, want to have in their hand or display in their home, I think is another way to go about some of this. Okay, and we have a question from Robert who uh, asked, if we were to do the drop shipping via your orders received, do we do that after payment is confir confirmed? We are a museum with are we are a museum with a museum store operation. I'm not sure I said that right, but uh, I think the question is that is the shipping of the order done after the payment is confirmed? Yes, the the payment would be captured so that payment is confirmed and then the shipping happens and then the payment then then the payment is processed as soon as I throw out the drop ship notification. It's considered shipped and then that payment gets captured and then I would also then send out a paper check to or get processed yes yeah. so that you get right. capture of the of the credit card information that triggers the um, sign to have the drop shipment happen then the credit card payment gets processed then and at some point after then, depending on how often the museum or the library wants to get paid, Dan would be cutting that paper check. Um, and I want to then go on to Tom's question. Actually, library commerce would have to take some percentage, and that would be something to work out with Dan, of the cost of each item ordered in order to cover uh, the cost of running the site and also so that Dan doesn't like uh, wander off into poverty, um, it will act like Amazon. It is like an Amazon on a smaller scale for cultural institutions. I think that because Dan is smaller than Amazon and isn't uh, needing to satisfy uh, investors or whatever, he can take a much smaller percentage than Amazon tends to do. But and I'll let Dan talk further about that. But it it is comparable to Amazon for libraries and cultural institutions. Yeah, I think right, that there. is an important point that we do need. Yes. This is a business. And we want to run it like a business, whoever is running it. So Dan does, we don't want Dan to starve. Uh, he does have a family, so it's important. <laughs> um, and so it's not a library really running this. It is, it is a person, uh, but the libraries are contracting with Dan if, in, uh, to uh, uh, have the service for them. Correct, Dan? Uh, correct. Um, uh, just uh, I, I have my uh, uh, Master in Library Science. I'm very interested in, in furthering the missions of libraries and whatnot. So I, th the idea behind this isn't, you know, a, a money grab, a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, a corporate entity or, or whatnot, but there is a bit behind it to help expand um, library marketing, exposure to libraries, help libraries get some revenue. At the same time, it does take money to operate the system. Um, I'm still currently operating at a loss because I haven't sold enough things to cover the expenses of the website and the third party providers. Um, and I'm doing a, a, a pretty aggressive uh, marketing scheme through social networking right now. Um, besides SEO, I'm using Facebook and Twitter and, and other social networking sites to try to get out there because I don't have the money for lists and whatnot. So that said, bringing in other libraries um, to sell things, there would be a small percentage. Um, and, and these are the discussions that I would like to have um, as to what that percentage would look like, 
depending on what services are being provided. If it's something that I would be doing the, the production as uh, for reprinting and whatnot, the cut would have to be a little bit bigger to cover expenses um, than if I'm just processing sales. Any questions related to this? Because it is a pie that we are trying different things. Uh, but Tom does respond, uh, thank you uh, for addressing that issue. He'd rather give his money to a small organization like you rather than Amazon. So I think that's really great to hear. Um, we did have a question about, um, cop Cindy had copyright questions. I'm not sure we've really answered her questions. And if she wants to uh, put in the chat box if there are further questions regarding copyright. Otherwise, uh, we can deal with those offline if that's OK. okay. Uh, in terms of uh, time frame, Michelle is asking, what is the time pr frame for involvement? We'd like to get started. <laughs> I think that's one short answer, and I'm not too flippant either. Um, does that, uh, Dan, I'll let you say how long it's likely to take to sh transition the actual site verbiage so that uh, Eastman Scores Publishing becomes one department rather than appearing to be the whole thing. It, it should not take that long. Uh, I can transfer uh, a number of, I, I can move things around the site very, very quickly. Um, as far as getting involved, um, I, I'd love to start discussions now. And then the question becomes, what type of inventory are you looking at selling? What type of product are you looking at selling? And how quickly can we have the mark records up for SEO and, and list the product and things like that? So. So, I mean, today I could have discussions with anybody about um, do you want to get involved, what would that look like, and then we can discuss what it will take to actually get things up on the site. And I think it can happen very, very quickly. Maybe not as quickly as posting something on eBay today because they're already built for this 30, you know, uh, individual sellers, but this... Um, could turn very, very quickly in a matter of days to get product up and, and change the website. Um, the I, And I actually wanted to go back and, and discuss uh, just the one more bit of how we're different than Amazon. The, the idea that this is library commerce or um, it, that would include museums and heritage sites and, 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 and organizations such as that, it actually helps uh, filter people to a specific niche, something that they're looking for, as opposed to going to Amazon that is so large that it's almost becoming too large. I mean, even though they do drill down pretty well, sometimes when something's that big, it's too big to be useful where something that's this small and has a mission on the nonprofits and the libraries um, it is a bit more helpful. Uh, one issue that you, you dealt with a little bit, both Alice and Dan, which would have an impact on all of the listeners who are talking about selling stuff, is the whole marketing issue. Because people do tend to go to Amazon, et cetera, to, quote, buy things. Um, can you speak a little bit about the marketing issues you dealt with and what you think might need to be done? Uh, a couple things about the marketing issues. Uh, number one, going into this um, specifically through scores, it was very difficult to determine who the, who the audience was going to be. I have a musicology background, and I was thinking there would be people interested in the older scores just because they're older scores. But then I had to think at, in, a, in a broader perspective. And when I started thinking about um, the New York State Music Association and how there's a number of listings for competitive solos that are currently out of print, but were in public domain and I could reprint them. It was it was an aha moment that I could find something out like that and then start marketing towards NISMA. And I've actually been in contact with NISMA and I intend to do that with a number of other state music associations. So as far as marketing is concerned, there's two things here. If you want to get involved in selling something, it helps to know who you're selling to. So if you have patrons that have been inquiring about specific things, pay attention to who they are because they're your 
prospective audience, they're your prospective buyer, um, even though you're still loaning things for free to them. Um, because uh, I don't know how many lists there are out there in, in marketing land for um, people that are looking to buy library related, historical related type things. Um, so marketing is, is, is a big issue. The other side of it is, and, and I'll keep bringing it back to the hub idea, this idea of synergy where if you look at the slide that's up right now, um, you will see underneath each of those items a, a library logo, whether it's Eastman School of Music or um, I, 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 it's really small so I can't read it right now, but they're, they're, um, with the HTML coding I can put a banner under everything. And so if somebody goes to Library Commerce, say from, uh, you know, they're looking for something from the Rochester Public Library, and they go there and they see all the things the Rochester Public Library has to offer, they're also seeing things that um, Milner Library from Geneseo has to offer. And so it then becomes uh, an idea that we're marketing for each other and it's that loose coalition, not necessarily loose, but it's that coalition of libraries helping market each other because people are driving in um, prospective customers from different angles and then enlightening them to all the other possibilities of things that are out there. And then it also may encourage them to come visit other libraries. Um, because they look, they have this for sale. I wonder what else they have in their collection. So, so in essence, library commerce would become an overarching uh, place where each institution could have its own storefront within library commerce. Correct? A storefront, um, the way that uh, it's designed, it, it's more departments. So, when you look at the the okay. top, let me see if I can get the arrow here. If you look at this area here, each of these would be different libraries. And you, if you clicked on one of those, you would get the listings for everything that that library offers. And that would act as a storefront. But if you go to the Library Commerce main page, you would see a number of featured items, all from different libraries. You could go to each specific library, or you could do the whole Library Commerce as a whole. Or you could drill down by products. That's pretty cool. So it's really a, a department store, a library department store. I like right. that. And each each library is a department. Yeah. One other Very thing cool. I wanted to bring up quickly before we end, because it looks like it's getting close, um, was a question uh, way back. Eleanor's question about um, historical societies. Uh, using the platform also mentioned um, selling current publications from local authors. And that is something that we could do. Obviously, we'd be paying the author. Um, but because this is so small, and so in that sense, on Amazon-like, that would be pretty simple to do. Um, also, we can sell things without ISBNs. Amazon doesn't like to accept books for sale unless they have ISBNs, uh, which is in an earlier um, webinar in this series, uh, there was some talk about uh, local authors and the, the, at the, the Rochester Public Library's uh, uh, festival, was it, <laughs> for local authors. Um, one of the requirements was that you had to have your own ISBNs. They cost money. About I, I think to, you can get one for a hundred dollars. You can get a thousand for a thousand dollars. I think you can also get. Uh, it's it's very uh, it's it's there because it makes you a publisher. It's a little hard to get an ISBN. And one thing that an, a local author could do in order to be able to afford one would be to sell things for a while without. That's one of the things that people do. And on library commerce, you could do that. And could certainly um, uh, help patrons uh, sell things through the website like that. OK, we, we are running out of time. Um, we have a couple of quick uh, ending questions. 
first of all, uh, please repeat how to get to the site that's on the slide, which is, uh, if you want to... Um, the site on the slide is just a mock-up. It does not yet exist. Right. And by getting like to, the library to, com soon. to the Library of Commerce website itself, the address is? The address, uh, to, the address to the Library of Commerce website is either www.librarycommerce.com, that's all one word, Library of Commerce, or you can use EastmanScoresPublishing.com. And those will both take you to Eastman Scores Publishing. Once we get other libraries in, the, the website would change to look more like the mock-up that was on the last slide that was just up. And a, a final question just from uh, Janine. Is there a limit to the quantity of items that can be listed? The uh, third-party provider allows me to actually go up to unlimited, but I, every time I reach a threshold, um, it costs more per month for me to use that, to use Volusion. Right now I'm limited to, uh, right now with the, the pay structure that I'm at, um, I'm limited to 1,000 items, and I'm at about 500, I believe. I have to double check that at this point. But uh, the more libraries that are using it, um, Hopefully, that means more revenue is coming in, and that then doesn't become an issue because um, the cost of running the site is covered, and anybody can put out whatever they, you know, they can sell however many items they want to sell. Okay, I great. We do need to end now. I'm sorry, we we are out of time. Uh, we did. I just want to make sure that everyone knows that the presentation will be available. You can share all these slides. Uh, you can contact. Dan or Alice with information, or you may contact uh, me, kmiller at rrlc.org. Um, we do a reminder that this is recorded, and it is available on the NY3R's website. We hope that you will share it with your colleagues, get them interested in this. If you are a participant in New York Heritage, you might want to contact your local council and ask them about uh, starting something like this or getting involved, because I think there is a lot of interest. So uh, I want to thank our guests, Alice and Dan. It's been very interesting. This topic always generates a lot of questions, and I'm sure we could have gone on for another half hour. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how we proceed after this. I think we have a lot of interest. And again, it is recorded. You can find it on the website. I hope you've enjoyed this dis discussion today. Uh, we hope that you will join us for our next presentation in this series, which will be called using the IR to document and disseminate faculty papers and scholarship. And our guests will be Kim Myers from the Drake Library at the College at Brockport and Juan Lee of Princeton University. That will be Wednesday, May 21st at noon. And you can register now, actually. You see the site on the uh, slide in front of you. Or just go to the NY3R's website. Before you go, please do click on the link you see here that will help you uh, do an evaluation of today's program. And once again, thank you for joining us. And thank you, Alice and Dan, for a most interesting presentation. Bye, everyone. We appreciate your attendance. Yeah.